Okay, thank you very much, Kieran. I'm Gary Hedges, and I am the Tunitra Regional Entomologist, um, working for uh, as part of the Tunitra Trust project at World Museum in Liverpool. Is that okay, Kieran? Yep, yeah, brilliant. Sorry. Off you go. Off you go. <laughs> Okay, the, the Tanipta project was originally a five year project, now 7.5 years until October 2024, externally funded by the Tanipta Trust and guided by a steering group of entomologists, including Phil Brighton, patron of the Tanipta Trust, Steve Judd, Ian Wallace, and Steve Garland. The project was set up to promote the study and conservation of insects and other invertebrates in the Lancashire and Cheshire region of Northwest England. Um, myself and Leanna Dixon are employed by National Museums Liverpool to work on the project. Um, and in a usual year, we reside in the entomology department at World Museum. So a big part of the project is in facilitating invertebrate recorders. We, so we, we've loaned dozens of books and microscopes. We've heavily invested in upgrading facilities that recorders can use. We've digitized thousands of pages of old regional journals and card indexes. We have a grant scheme that supports individual recorders and groups. Our recording days program helps bring recorders together and helps gain access to new sites. We work with recording groups. For example, we recently joined forces with Lancashire Moth Group to create an online atlas this year. Um, we have run 47 in-person courses and hosted 39 webinars um, which are on our YouTube channel. Um, some of them are really outstanding, you know, some up to two or three part series, you know, that almost akin to a field guide in terms of identifying every species within a group, for example, um, Paul, that Paul Richards did for, for Harvestman. So they're well worth checking out. So in terms, in terms of the courses, we, we, we run them on a, on a rather smaller scale to Biolinks. Um, but there's, there's still plenty to get involved with um, in Northwest England. So just in case, I'd rather do this at the beginning than at the end, in case some of you have to leave early. Um, we've just got some um, upcoming workshops at World Museum in Liverpool. We haven't had a workshop, an in-person workshop at the museum since February last year. So we're really excited um, to, to get them going again. And, and the first one is, is towards the end of October. Um, and I notice I think Biolinks have got a, a, an insect collection cu curatorial one with, with Pete Borman soon as well. So there's, there's more than that one opportunity with Biolinks. Um, and I'd really, yeah, I'd really advise you going. I know many of you today are probably not from the Northwest, but um, hopefully, you know, you, you would consider doing a, a, a day trip to some of these courses. I think I think they're booking up quite strongly already, so it's worth, um, you know, they are quite uh, restricted on numbers, especially with, with COVID. So um, I would, yeah, suggest looking at those as soon as possible if, if you're interested. Um, so we also promote invertebrate conservation research. We've commissioned several surveys which seek to improve our understanding of threatened species in the region, which is the main part of this talk as well as assemblage habitat and, and site surveys that we commission. Um, can you see my mouse? There we go. Look. Um, I'll also give an example uh, of a recording project supported by our small grant scheme. So I'm going to mainly talking about threatened species surveys, and then I'm just going to touch on one of the from a small grant. Um, so which invertebrates are, are threatened? Where, where to begin with this? Um, how do we get to the point of commissioning surveys? The project has had some very fortunate timing where there's been a proliferation of national status reviews by Natural England, including the spider review by Natural Resources Wales, so not, not just Natural England. And these have assessed the species records in various groups and assigned new GB rarity and national threat statuses based on IUCN guidelines. And there's many groups to cover, but they've done a, an awful lot of work in the last few years, which has which has really helped us. And so, so from those new national status reviews, we need to find out which of those threatened species have actually been recorded within the, 
within the Northwest England project area. I say Northwest England in a, in a loose sense because it doesn't include uh, uh, Cumbria, which obviously has, has the Lake District, just the Lancashire and, and Cheshire region. So, so this part of that is, is data collection as well, once we have those status reviews. So it's a big data gathering exercise. It was with the main sources being the, the local environmental record centers, the MBN Atlas and rec national recording schemes, also in co consultation with um, regional and, and, and local experts. And this, this slide I do, I've just put on because I like it really, uh, because this slide just, just reminds me to, to thank all the recorders, data providers and status report writers you know, else we'd, we'd be in the dark really over, over what to prioritize. So eventually we came up with um, a basic list of species uh, we think are in need of survey work to update our knowledge on status and distribution. And this is ever evolving and doesn't include all threatened species because some have actually had some recent, recent work done even before we started. Um, and most of the nationally threatened species in the Lancashire and Cheshire region have come from three main areas, although there are many exceptions, and these being the Morecambe Bay limestones in North Lancashire, uh, the Mears and Mosses of, of, of the Delamere area, and then the sand dunes of the Sefton coast. There's also um, um, a big area of remnant bogs uh, in the Manchester area called the Manchester Mosses, they had a bit more uh, degradation um, over recent centuries, uh, but there's, a, there's an awful lot of work to, to great work to, to restore those at the moment. So due to time constraints this afternoon, I've only really got time to introduce you to some of the species that we've studied on the Sefton coast. Um, this is this is north of Liverpool um, and the Sefton Coast itself is part of a, a triple SI that stretches 20 kilometers and covers over four and a half thousand hectares. And in terms of wildlife, it's, it's really famed for its Natajak toad populations, red squirrels and, and sand lizards and, and great botany too. But um, I just wanted to quickly introduce you to just get, get an idea of the scale of the place. This is an enormous, sand dune system, one of the largest in the country and, and as internationally important. Um, and this is just one of the sites um, which are all connected up on the Sefton Coast. This is at Ainsdale and you can see um, some very nice wetland habitat here as well as these are sort of coming into much more fixed dunes. Um, and you can see the four dunes over here and the beach and then into the into the pine woods where the red squirrels live. But this, this site in particular is, is incredibly important for invertebrates. Okay. And, and, this, and the Sefton Coast Triple SI has got uh, a few um, land landowners, the National Trust owning a big swathe of land, Natural England um, as well with two, two NNRs and um, Sefton Council as well. And, and lower than uh, this, this map shows, High Town as well is, is owned by the council. That's an important um, sand dune area as well, but it's, it's not within the triple SI. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a very um, dynamic system and over the decades it's been estimated that 81% of the bare sand has been lost and it's also a, a lot drier um, now and, and a major concern is to understand whether some of those species that depend on the mobile or, or fixed dune habitat have been lost due, due to these changes. And so we're going to start um, on the four dunes here, I'll, 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 I'll briefly take you through a few species surveys um, and, and sort of work into the fixed dune areas. Um, and, and note the enormous sand hills here that you, those are, people bring um, sledges to, 
to go down those and, and that can be quite dangerous as well they're really very high sand hills and that's quite a rare thing to see um I, I i don't know the whole british coastline but i've never i've never come across uh, sand dunes of this size anywhere else so a very very important feature so to so one of the um surveys that we commissioned expert arachnologist Rich and Gallen to do this year um, was to study the mobile dune spider assemblage of the Sefton coast. Um, for, for spiders, it's, it's, it's a difficult and unproductive habitat um, to work and, it, and it, so it's often ignored and so it's really, spiders are really under-recorded on these mobile dune areas. And these, this is one of the main targets um, this amazingly camouflaged, nationally rare and vulnerable crab spider, clearly very well adapted for bare sand in terms of its camouflage there. And, and this survey, what it involved is, is basically grubbing uh, around at the base of Marham, right next to the beach. Um, whereas, yes, basically all there is is, is Marham and bare sand. And this survey is about to recommence, uh, having started in the spring. There's been various interesting spider records so far, including scarce sand dune specialists, but Rhizodromus phallax has only been found in a very restricted area of the most mobile dunes at, at Formby Point, which is about halfway along the, the SSSI. Um, hopefully it's more wide, wide, widespread than that. Um, as sites are researched this autumn when there'll be sub adults during the middle of the summer there's just spiderlings about and they're very hard to find and um, so it's better to do it in this in the spring or the autumn and and where where it has been was found this spring by Richard is the is where it was first found with the only record that was from the 1980s until uh, myself and Tony Hunter found it last year again in exactly the same area um, so, it, you know, it may well be restricted to a very small part of the triple SI, but, but hopefully not. And just to show really, this is, this is further south um, on the Sefton coast, uh, Cabin Hill National Nature Reserve. And this is, this is much more fixed next to the beach there um, with cooch grass. And it's, it's really unsuitable for Rhizodromus phallax. It's, um, yeah, it just does. It doesn't have it doesn't have the bare sand that it needs. It doesn't have the barren that it needs, and and not not to say this is a is necessarily a put you know a bad habitat for everything. Um, I think sat, that's the food plant of uh, of Sandhill Rustic, which I know is there, which is a a very scarce um, macro moth. Um, but bare sand is absolutely essential for Rhizodromus phallax, so. Um, it's just it's just not going to be found here. So we'll see. But I just uh, moving on to another mobile sand dune specialist, Rhizothorax rufus. Um, this is this is an endangered scarab beetle related to the to, to dung beetles, obviously. And this is absolutely restricted to extensive mobile sand dune systems in, in this country. It's also rare in Europe and throughout its range. And despite dedicated searches um, in the recent years, it hadn't been seen in the UK since um, 2008. And that was at Merthyr Moor Warren in Wales. And there's another Welsh site, Kenfig Dunes, with a single 1994 record. Um, and then at 2005 at Ainsdale on the Sefton coast. Um, and those are the only three modern sites um, in, in this country, but, you know, nothing, not, this beetle not, not seen since 20 to 2008. Um, and this one, it's, it's a bit similar to Rhizodromus phallax in the way you have to look for it. It's quite, it's quite a hard work. So last spring, I, I spent a few days covering as much ground as possible on the mobile dune habitat focusing really on where the sort of detritus builds up around the marrow and at the bottom of blowouts where you just get these piles of, of bodies of insects and other you know bits of dead vegetation and you basically use a 
a good way to do it is using a, a sieve. So this is the kitchen sieve that I often got told off for, for taking out. Um, and you're basically sieve, sieving that detritus and, and hoping, because this is, is a very, very short-lived insect as an adult, you know, you often, historical records, although occasionally found alive, is more often found, found dead. Um, and the results of that was that um, I ended up finding three dead specimens uh, in, the, in the most mobile areas again. And one, one of those was actually about three or four meters from where Rhizodromus phallax, that crab spider was found. So clearly a very important little area there. Um, so although this beetle has probably declined hugely because from, from the accounts, from Victorian records and the number of specimens in in World Museum. We, we've got quite a number um, from the 19th century. Um, it's probably declined hugely, and but it, you know we know that it's it's still extant at this site, and you know it's a very good reason to promote the creation of new mobile dune habitat. And this, those green, those red dots there are just showing where I found these three dead specimens. And you can see here, these are the really the mobile dune areas. Uh, these white bits and there's, as you go along the coast, th these are the best bits. So, and that's just, this is just the Formby area. And there's a little bit um, further north uh, f to Fisherman's Path, um, Ainsdale, but it's, yeah, we couldn't find it there and it's not been found there for, for over 20 years. So hopefully it hangs, it hangs on there as well, but, but it, we just can't find it. Um, and just a bit of added value from, from this um, short survey really, that we, you know, we didn't find anything new about its ecology or very precisely about where it's breeding. But some added value by barcoding a uh, DNA barcoding a specimen and getting a new species added to the, the DNA barcoding database, which is which is bold. Um, so that's that's something. So moving then on to some of the the, the more fixed tunes. Um, was another another commissioned survey this year was. Uh, a Micromoth Anacampsis temerella, which is in the Gallicidae family. Um, that is, there's found in really extensive fixed dune systems, but it's, it's it's rarely recorded in this country. It was it was given a provisional RDB that's red data, but two status in 2012, but likely to be classified as vulnerable. There's not a um, a recent IUCN um, status review of of the micromoths, so they don't have they don't have a threat status in the same way as some other groups with recent status reviews have. Um, but, but seventy years ago, this species was described as common on the Sefton coast. But the last record from the Sefton coast was a was a three moth from the Formby area in nineteen eighty four. Despite recent surge searches, so um, the last and the last Lancashire records of the moth that were netted on the filed coast at Lytham St Anne's, which is a bit further north, in 2007 and 2013. And that 2013 record is the last time this moth was recorded in this country. Um, and the last larval record was from Ainsdale in 1976. Um, so it's, so we're really wanting to find out this year whether still occurs um, on the Sefton coast. And this is this is a distribution for the moth for all, all records. But as I said, um, there had been there'd been no records since 20, 2013. Um, and so th this is creeping willow. This is the this is the food plant of Anacampsis temerella in in the UK, it has been recorded on different Salic species in Ireland. Um, but there's a, there's another 
species Anacampsis populella that does the same thing um, as in terms of making a, a spinning on the terminal leaves of creeping willow and it looks identical. Um, so, so the larvae and, and spinnings, they had to be as, as part of the survey, which Ben Smart, um, and a, a, a superb um, lepidopterist who is, is, a, is an expert breeder and is expert micromoth sort of field science, has written a book about it, which you may well have. Um, he, he took on this commission for us and, um, but he had to, so he had to get larvae and spinnings. Um, he, had to, he had to find them in the field on the southern coast and uh, collect them and breed them through to actually confirm um, what they were. And, and Ben, so Ben had his sort of eureka moment at home as uh, he, he managed to breed through 20 Anacampsis temerella and he, and he drove them back to the southern coast to release them. But he, he also, that was only about 20% of what he found. The other more than 80% uh, was, was this much more common one, Anacampsis populera emerged. So, so in the end, he found the Anacampsis temerella at four separate sites on Ainsdale and Birkdale. And it's hopefully quite widespread on the Sefton coast. Um, it would be good to know if it's also still at, at Formby and, and, and further south. And, and there's also more, you know, micro habitat needs that, 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 that are to be found out. But this is, this is a great result that, it, that it's still there and, and seems to be doing okay. And really a big, a big bonus from, from this particular survey um, has, gained, has been gained from the knowledge that the, the final instar can be identified as a larva in the field so that, you, so that you don't have to breathe them through. So you can see these are the, this is the, this is the rare one, Anacampsis temerella. And it basically has a much smaller, a pinnacula on the on the abdominal plates. These are these these black speckles on the abdominal plates. You can see they're much smaller than populella here. And you can also see, I, I can't see this because I've got these buttons covering up, but hopefully I'm I'm putting my mouse around sort of the anal plate there, which I don't you won't be able to see that one in these pictures, but it's a bit of orange brownie on populella. And again, I don't know if you can see, but it's sort of black speckles on Anacampsis temerella. And these are final instars. So um, you won't be too sure if they're, if they're much earlier, but they're, they're quite easy to tell. So when, when they're final instar, this one also Anacampsis temerella is, is a little bit smaller as a final instar. It's only eight mil, um, you know, turns into a smaller adult moth. And Anacampsis populella is a 12, 12 mil. Um, and, and this and this new knowledge um, can be used to, you know, find more sites in the UK or monitor the species without the added effort and removing specimens to, 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 to having to take them off site. From those, those the spinnings that I show you, they're, you know, tightly woven with silk. You can, you know, you do have to open those up to actually find a, a larva inside, um, which, you, which you might think, oh, well, that's surely doing damage there, uh, opening up that spinning, but they do, they just remake it. Um, you know, they, obviously it's gonna cost them in terms of energy to make that, but it's, it's not gonna be like, a, it's not gonna be fatal to, to the moth or anything. So that's a, that's a really good development for this species in terms of future surveillance and monitoring. And then just and, and then more added value um, from, from Ben's survey is that he found 20 other Lepidoptera species feeding on this on the creeping willow. Um, these are just some of them. And and he he would have missed certain species because some of the noctuids they're only going to be feeding, you know, they're only going to be hiding 
in the daytime and then coming on the plants to feed at night, um, in, including one of the one of the rarities on the Sefton coast, which feeds on creeping willow, which is the Portland moth. And he, he didn't find that either. And that can be also owing to the different times of the year. You know, Ben was only looking when the target species was likely to be as a, a, a final in star. So, yeah, really showing the value of this plant in the fixed juice um, system, you know, it's amazing value just for Lepidoptera and there'll be lots of other insects that are, that are, that are feeding on this, on this shrub. Really quite a remarkable assemblage. So, so on to another species on in the fixed dune system, but on the on the wetlands in the, in the dune slacks. This is um, semi-aquatic weevil, um, nationally rare and, and provisionally vulnerable. Although the status review for, for weevils hasn't hasn't quite come out yet, um, and so bagoas weevils. You think of weevils as as you know eating vegetation on, on trees and things. But these actually spend a lot of their time underwater. They're especially adapted for that. And this particular species, all, all bagoas tend to be tend to be rare and, and, and difficult to find. And this is one of the rarer ones. We actually get three species of being recorded on the Sefton coast, but bagoas lutosis is, is, is the rarest. So this um, hadn't been recorded on the Sefton coast since 1995 and there's only three post-World War II sites since uh, yeah in, in the UK so one in the Brecon um, and one in Norfolk as well so it's only been known for a very very small number of water bodies and and then even pre-war there's only a very few other dots and this, this specimen is from Leicestershire, uh, which will be that one, um, Saddington Reservoir, which we, 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 we didn't, which we were sort of questioning whether that was actually correct, but it's in Oxford Museum and I've gone and looked at it and it, and it definitely is, is right. Um, so this survey was started in 2019 and, and, and Bagoas lutosis in the UK had never been associated with with a food plant but in Europe it being been found to uh, eat potamogeton species and they've been associated with potamogeton gramineus and possibly other potamogetons but it was formerly thought to have been associated with branch burrweed and amphibious bistor it was thought to be eating on the Sefton coast um, so, although in, in Ireland it, be, it has been associated in, in Galway with fen pond weed, Potomgeaton coloratus, um, no one's ever actually seen it eating in, in the UK. So, but because of the European work that it was definitely associated with Potomgeaton, it has been recorded on Potomgeaton gramineus, this sort of allowed me to really target where the old, you know, get the possum eating gramineous records and and target those those slacks which had this plant. Um, and actually the first time we looked for this was a group of us in, in 2018 and we and we didn't find it. Um, but in, but, it, but we did find a different big species. So in 2019 when the Natural History Museum in association with Natural England and I think other, other partners, they ran a Geno Blitz at um, Ainsdell NNR. And, and I thought, well, I know where this other big uh, slack for that is. So I can, I can get one to, to, to get this one barcoded. And it ended up finding big lutosis, the original one that we wanted to find the much rarer species and this really set me off on a on a survey to really find to systematically search every possible wet mature slack where the food plant could be um, to see exactly where this this beetle occurs on the Sefton coast and you can quickly quickly rule out most 
um, slacks um, because they they they've dried up and they're and just not wet during the summer, which this um, pondweed needs. So, sort of whittled down to a to a, a few historic records, which I was able to reconfirm five with Potomagetan and find another three three new sites for the Potomagetan. So that's eight slacks out of about 300 on the Sefton coast, which have actually got this pondweed in it. And it ended up the survey finding three of these slacks. So three out of roughly 300 slacks have actually got, actually occupied by this um, beetle. So it's, so it's, it's, it's not exactly common the June slack. So this is this is just one on it, on its food plant here, and this is so far has been sort of the the, the best slack for it, where it's it's clearly doing has, has a good strong colony here. But this this particular slack had been sort of earmarked to be scraped out for the Natajack toads. So Natajack toads. So that's that didn't happen. Uh, you know, owing to this this finding and, and and really it's probably the management for the natajack toad which includes creating new scrapes because the natajacks don't like the vegetation um, that then mature and get and, and get vegetation and then possibly become a few of them become suitable for this for this weevil so it's probably so although the natajack management has probably looked after this weevil over the last few decades you've still got there's still that risk where if they they become unsuitable for the toad but good for the weevil that you you don't decide to dig those out for the toad again if there's only possibly only three um slacks for this weevil on the whole sefton coast and and if there's only two in two ponds in norfolk and and one in brecon you know you're looking at six water bodies in the whole of the uk for this Weevil that are known about at the moment, but it's it's now in there, along with a few other species from these from these surveys, now in the in the Ainsdale sand dunes and in our management plan, which we're very pleased about. So it really raises awareness of that. And 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 I've actually watched it. I've got a little video which I, sh I should have shown you really because it's this weevil is very slow. Its its common name is the Miri sloth weevil. They're big guys. are very slow moving. Um, so it doesn't do very much in the video, but just to show it, show its movement. And basically, I've watched it feeding on this Potomgeton graminius. So it's clearly using this on on the Sefton coast. And Potomgeton is quite rare on the Sefton coast, uh, but, you know, because most of the slacks dry up and they're just not deep enough or suitable. So that was some really good added value from this survey. Still need to be written up. Um, another bonus, really, from this one was three new water bodies for this. Uh, Bagoas luculentus, which feeds on horsetails. Um, that, that's also likely to be vulnerable in a new review. So, it, so it's another threatened invertebrate there, but probably a lot more widespread. There's a lot more suitable slacks on the Sefton coast. So I, I think it'll be new places. And it's also, this species also wasn't represented on, on the bold database. So that's another new species on there and what what was really interesting when i uh barcoded where we, we got this uh a specimen of bagoas lutosis barcode is that it was matching to to this bagoas limosis so so it, uh, a different species which also occurs on the Sefton coast so straight away i was thinking what have i done have i got this completely all wrong here um However, it, it, I, the, this one, Bagoas limosis, it was, it was named, was, you know, it had a picture, for, it was from Slovakia, and it had a picture with it, which is really helpful, because I could see that that isn't, you know, it doesn't look like limosis to me, and it, and it looks like the same as me, even though it's been named something else. And so I was able to, and, it, and this resides in uh, Munich Museum. So I was able to write to the person who made the determination at Munich Museum 
and, and just say, you know, maybe this is worth a, a check. And they straight away went to the collection, checked the specimen, and it was lutosis, the same as, as what I thought I'd found, um, which was brilliant. So it just goes to show another way that barcoding is potentially has its benefits is that, you know, I was able to, to flag a, a specimen collected in Slovakia that's in Munich Museum that I flag it as probably, you know, incorrectly identified, even though I'm, you know, sat here in Liverpool. So that's great. Um, and then an, another one, probably the, the rarest of all, one of the rarest beetles in, in the UK, because it's only got one site and only ever has, just critically endangered, it was thought possibly extinct, Anosius brevis. Um, but in 2017, this is, uh, you know, a long time ago now, Kerry Watkins and Darren Mann did a survey for this one. And um, basically they, they, they found it after more than 20 years and uh, through searching rabbit middens. And that's a, that's a really excellent find. And there's a little bit more to that story, but that is on a, another talk um, that I did for NFBR. So I'm not gonna say anything more about that one, but you can, you can have a look on, the, maybe they'll put a link to my NFBR talk where I mentioned about that species. That was, a, that was an amazing and very exciting find and that's in the management plan as well. And that's now seems to be thriving with, with cattle being on the site during the summer, which it really wants instead of rabbit dung. So, and, and also because of this, because Darren and Kerry managed to find Amosius brevis, is a category A species for bug life's project about designating important invertebrate areas. And so because they found that, and there's a recent record of it, there's critically endangered species, the whole of Ainsdale uh, sand dunes was, they designated an important invertebrate area. So that was another benefit around that. And I just wanted to really quickly mention, there was another uh, successful survey, this time for Podolonia affinis on the Sefton coast, which is again a, a fixed June thing, which Ben Hargreaves did for this. And I'm not going to say anything more about that because I don't think I've got time. Um, but that was found after 20 years as well, of not being seen. On the Sefton coast, well, we also done a couple of recording days, which have which have gone really well, very popular. There's a military um, firing range at, at Altcar um, on the Sefton coast, where the public don't normally have access to. But we managed to to go there a couple of times with with permission on on non-firing days, and found yeah, 636 species in the, over those two days of, of just invertebrates were were found. So you know, these, and that was an under-recorded part of the Sefton Coast because it was inaccessible um, to the public usually. So, and this is just one of the species found, border shield bug, which was new to Merseyside at the time, a couple of years ago now. And also found at Alt Cows, new to um, Britain, Ichthyomonid wasp, which is probably feeding on micromoth on, on pines there, which, uh, my colleague Tony Hunter found, um, and that's published. And separate from the SNP, SNP project, Tony's also been studying the Sefton Coast um, in, in the past couple of years for Richie Monads. So there's a lot more going on on the Sefton Coast. And this was another wasp, which is the first British record that, he, that he's found there. So, and that's just about to go in the British Entomological Society Journal, I think. So, and, and I just wanted to mention, we, we've been commissioning some work and we've been doing some internal work ourselves, but just to um, say, you know, that there is a huge amount of, of study of the Sefton Coast invertebrates and there is a huge amount still to find out. And, and, and there's quite a few people going there almost every day and, and, and finding amazing things there. Um, and just a, a couple of blogs to mention that are on the Northwest Invertebrates website, but um, yeah, there's some really amazing dedicated recorders. You know, I don't really want to mention names because I'm gonna I'll forget a load of them. But Pete, Pete Kinsella did this uh, blog on this new paper wasp very recently, and Phil Smith has as, as an updated a really with with Pete Kinsella has updated a really nice account of the robber flies of the Sefton Coast 
And those two are absolutely prolific recording invertebrates and finding new things on the Sefton coast. But amongst others, there are lots of work going on. And, uh, it's, it's not just us. And then just to mention a, 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 a small, an example of a project from which has been supported by a small grant scheme. So a grant scheme supported our, our area organizer for the British Arachnological Society. Now this is Rich Berkmar, um, which the grant sort of covered this, uh, a new vacuum sampler. And Rich did a, did a project on looking at um, the bog spiders in, in, in Cheshire and Lancashire mainly focusing on the on the sort of the Manchester mosses and some in in northern Lancashire and that report is online but there was there was a couple of really standout finds from that and this is showing really a map of um the, the former extent of peatland I was talking about the Manchester mosses and all the the purple um stuff is is, is former bog is, is is gone now um but i'm just going to point you to this site here which is holcroft moss which is largely uncut for peat and that was one of the sites that they that um that rich went to and i think in the that's the first time he he went there as as part of this project he found um this species which he was able to confirm in in England uh, for the first time, it there was there was a there was an old record from Alan Scott who passed away, but there was no voucher specimen. It couldn't be verified, but now that's been accepted because um, Rich found it. So that was that was a very exciting find. This is a, a very you know it's a nationally rare spider as well. So that was that was a really good outcome. But the but the really the you know the real headline find which. Uh, went in a few, um, I think, online newspapers and things. Was this Sibian or Lare at Holcroft Moss? This is a Cheshire Wildlife Trust site. And this is one where Rich had identified it when he got back as a, a different Sibian or Orosynctus, I, I think. Um, but it, which has a which has a quite an unusual distribution, which. Um, but people, I suppose people hadn't thought that maybe, maybe there's something else going on there. But then when, because Rich had found this Heliophansis, Heliophansis, Heliophansis Damphii, um, previously, Richard Gallen then went out with, with Rich and they, and they found more of these Sibiano. And when they got home, they were looking at them again and they realised that, you know, Rich's original identification was, you know, wasn't right, and and then they and they they thought it, they suddenly realised it was this Sibian or Lare, and they actually crossed emails identifying it. So, um, but this but this species hadn't been recorded in the UK before, um, and so the the hap it happens to be that Dmitri Log Loganoff, who works at uh, as a creator of arthropods at Manchester Museum, he. Uh, is, the, is like the world authority who described this genus originally. So they sent specimens to him to, to, for confirmation. And, you know, it's very exciting, you know, new to Britain spider, bog, bog spider that's, I think, still only um, being found at this one site, Holcroft Moss. But because of this, if I just quickly go back to slide, they, there was also a specimen um, from Kirkby Moss, which no longer exists in Liverpool Museum from 1924, and that was also sent to Dimitri because uh, I think it was identified as this other Sibiano. So they thought, well, you know, that could be also Lare, and it turned out to be so. And this other Sibiano was recorded somewhere else as well, so which which doesn't exist. So although this may be the only site left now Holcroft Moss for this for this spider there was there's, there's two that used to exist two bogs that used to exist which no longer do which definitely did have this spider so you know that was a really exciting and and it's just 
you know, this, this is all rich, Bergmeier and Rich Gallen's work, but to just be, for the temperature project to be associated with it through the, through the small grant scheme, able to support recorders in doing these sorts of projects is, you know, is, is exactly what we want to do. And just some other, other examples of where we've supported, you know, recorders projects uh, around publications, um, this excellent publication on the bees, wasps and ants of Lancashire by Ben Hargreaves and, 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 and Steve White with the Lancashire and Cheshire Fauna Society came out um, this year, which we supported pub, uh, part of the publication costs and we supported the printing costs of, of this whole life of saddle work by Ken Gartside, who's, who's told me that it's, it's, it's helped to, you know, inspire more recording in the area. Um, so that's brilliant. And this one, not so much of a grant, but this was a, another book that we helped to, to, to get published. Um, and you'll be you'll be pleased. I'm just coming to the end, just in, in time, Kieran. So, um, so this is just a reminder, really, to to that you can get involved, go and and, and sign up to one of our workshops upcoming. But also, there's other ways to you can you can get off get on with the project. We don't just do threatened species surveys. Um, we also support new resources coming out and uh, there's lots of new checklists that recorders have done and, and sent to us for, for the website and various other reports and I, I haven't mentioned anything on the uh, species and, and site surveys that we've done in Cheshire at all because a year ago I did a talk for Record, uh, the local rec centre for Cheshire which that's and there's a recording of that online already although this we've done quite a lot since actually so uh, you, can, you can come to me in another year and I'll probably have a, a load of other things I could could go on about but thank you very much for for listening and uh, yeah I don't know if there's, there's time for any questions but yeah thank you very much for for hosting the talk by the links thanks for thank you for giving the talk Gary we really appreciate it. yeah it's really interesting to hear um, the impact of all that recording and the things that you found and obviously you've still got time to make an even, even bigger impact with, with more things. So I think we can maybe manage two questions. So if anybody would, has got a burning question, you're going to need to raise your hand. Otherwise, Gino is going to have to be um, particularly selective. So Gino, while people decide if they're, if they're willing to raise their hand, have you got uh, what's your priority one question from the chat? Um, okay, so my question is from Chris Hunter. And he asks, do you have a good idea of the number of northern dune tiger beetles on the Sefton coast? And are they still only found in two areas in England or have they been found anywhere else? Okay. Um, the northern dune tiger beetle, Synclinella hybrida, this is... On, on the Sefton coast, I would actually say it's pretty common. You, I've, yeah, they're, they, you know, they really, you probably know they, they really love the bare sand and a lot of work has been going on to improve the areas of bare sand. But on a good, on a nice sunny day in the right time of year in the, in the summer, th there will be hundreds, there'll be thousands of them because there's so many different, even little, even small, Bare, pan, satch, bare sand patches inland, you, you could you could find them. So they'll be in they'll be in very good numbers. Although I think the, the gems in the dunes project have been doing some transects. I think you know like butterfly transects where they do count them. Um, and I know they've been finding them finding them in new areas where they've been creating new areas of bare sand. It's, it's been an excellent project which has come to the come to the end. And then the others, uh, yes, they're found on the west coast of, of, of Cumbria now as well at Drigg. Um, and I think that when they've been counted by people like Steve Hewitt, they've been found in good numbers there. But I, those are the only two areas I know of. And then further south, because it's and then it becomes another species, Maritima, which I think maybe likes it a bit more on the four dunes. That's my, I don't know them that well, but... Yeah, I don't think they've been found anywhere else, as far as I know. 
Right. Thank you for that, Gary. Gino, I think we can maybe squeeze one last one in. Okay. We've got a question from Stephen Green, and he wants to know how does Anacampsis populella compare in terms of distribution and food plants? Um, yeah, it's uh, Anacampsis populella. I believe that, again, this, the, the problem is I'm speaking for other people who, who actually done the surveys for us, but populella, I understand, does eat other salix species. It's not just on creeping willow and it's not just a coastal species as far as I know. I think it's, I think it's much more widespread and found in land. And, but um, I would, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's much more common species, but yeah, that'll be all that, that sort of information should be readily available with hopefully on the, uh, on Moth UK or something. Thank you very, thank you very much, Gary.